It was supposed to be a test, a simulation of how a large-scale nuclear power plant in communist-era Ukraine would handle a complete shutdown of its system if the reactor ever needed to be taken offline. There was a concern about how to keep the reactor's uranium fuel from overheating before the emergency cooling pumps would kick in. Every second counts when you are dealing with extremely hot radioactive elements. The operators need to find a way to cover 50 seconds of time in order to prevent a meltdown, and the engineers came up with a novel approach. But the engineers didn't count on design flaws and a Soviet bureaucracy loath to admitting mistakes. The result was history's worst nuclear disaster ever. Thousands sickened or dead from radioactive poisoning, nuclear fallout across two continents, and a land that is still uninhabitable today. This is the end, beautiful friend. This is the end. Greetings, kittens. My Welcome to the Podcast of Doom, the podcast devoted to epic failure analysis. My name is David Appleson. In this episode, we will examine the nuclear explosion and meltdown at the Chernobyl reactor in Ukraine. It was the worst nuclear plant disaster ever, which is saying a lot since there is so much potential for really bad things to happen with a nuclear reactor. The radioactive mix of uranium and graphite burned for days as the Soviets attempted to figure out how to put out the nuclear fire. The disaster left radioactive hotspots all over the nearby areas in Ukraine and Belarus, some of which are still uninhabitable today. The fire also spewed radioactive particles not just into the immediate area, but all over Europe and parts of Asia. The number of people who died from this accident is probably in the thousands, if not tens of thousands. The nuclear power industry was forever changed following Chernobyl and it had an enormous influence on historical events. But let's start the story by explaining how electricity was discovered and put to use, because nuclear energy is about the production of electricity and the money and labor we are willing to dedicate to produce copious amounts of electricity. After all, we live in an electric world, even though sometimes our devotion to the Internet and social media tend to make us forget that all those phones, tablets, and computers would go black without power. Electricity has changed our lives and literally lit up our planet. When the power goes out, it isn't just an inconvenience. For those dependent on machines for vital bodily functions, it is a matter of life and death. People have been aware of electricity since time immemorial. We could see the power of a lightning bolt, and we understood that some fish and eels can deliver a zapping charge when threatened. In ancient times, some people discovered that rubbing certain objects like rods of amber with other objects like cat fur could make a third object like a feather stick to the fur. You can even get similar results at home using a rubber balloon, the hair on your head, and a plaster wall. We call that static electricity. The idea of being able to produce electricity for productive purposes doesn't really come along until the 17th century, when English physicist William Gilbert noticed that rocks called lodestones did not need to be rubbed to attract other objects. Lodestones were inherently magnetic, and he called this property electricus, after the Latin word for like amber. In the 18th century, Prussian physicist Ewald Jörg von Kleist and Dutch scientist Peter von Muschanbroek independently invented similar contraptions made of glass and foil that could actually store electricity. This contraption would later be called the Leiden jar, named after the city in the Netherlands where van Muschenbroek made his discovery. As all American schoolchildren are supposed to know, Benjamin Franklin discovered that lightning was actually an electrical charge when he dangled a metal key from a kite string in an electrical storm and felt electrical shocks jumping from the key to his hand. In the 19th century, Danish scientist Hans Christian Ørsted realized that electricity and magnetism were related. Electricity could be used to produce magnetism, and magnets could be used to produce electricity. Following that discovery, it was British scientist Michael Faraday who built the first functioning electrical motor, using mostly items you could find around your household. Faraday would go on to produce the Faraday disk, 
which is basically a machine that runs an electrically conductive disc made of copper past a magnet repeatedly. This produced a small direct current which in theory could be used to turn a motor, but in practice was too weak to turn anything. Oh well, so much of science's theory and Faraday's disc would be refined by other scientists and inventors in order to make it practical. One of those inventors discovered that wrapping a copper wire around a bar of metal was much more efficient at producing a current than a copper disc. In 1832, French instrument maker Hippolyte de Pixie ran the north and south poles of a spinning magnet past a piece of iron wrapped with insulated wire. Pixie's machine was still inefficient. Later refinements would make it more efficient, but his machine is generally credited as the first dynamo, or electrical current producing machine. These early dynamos were hand cranked, so in order to scale up for industrial use, we needed a bigger hand. No, of course I'm kidding. We needed a much larger force to turn the crank. In 1884, the Anglo-Irish engineer Sir Charles Parsons invented the first steam turbine, which is a machine that maximizes the energy of rising steam to turn a series of rotary blades. Now the spinning blades in the turbine can be used to turn a dynamo, which can be used to run electricity through a wire to your home to run your blow dryer, Keurig coffee maker, or Nintendo system. That takes us through the steampunk era. Are you ready for the nuke punk era? So there are several types of turbines, water, gas, and steam, being a few of the more popular ones. Early sources of fuel used to produce electricity included coal, oil, and flowing water in the form of hydroelectric power, which is really just a modern version of the old water mill. When the atom was split in the race to create the first nuclear weapon, its creators realized that the enormous energy released from nuclear chain reactions could be used to generate electricity. In fact, whenever a new invention is discovered, man immediately asks two important questions. One, how can we make money off of this? And two, how can we kill people with this? Question two is already answered, so let's look at how both the capitalistic West and communist East answered question one. I will not review the history of how nuclear energy was discovered, as that was covered in episode 16, The Bombing of Nagasaki. If you're interested, I encourage you to listen to that episode, as it is a pretty fascinating story. In the summer of 1942, a real low point for the Allies during World War II, Russian physicist Georgi Flerov wrote a letter to Soviet leader Joseph Stalin urging him to immediately invest in research on atomic energy, after he had noticed that the topic had completely disappeared from international scientific journals. Something was going on. The Soviet Union was falling behind in this important area of research, and Flerov did not want his country to miss out on the race to build a nuclear weapon. Stalin, who must have received plenty of similar petitions from scientists in other fields, took this one quite seriously. He appointed his right-hand man, Leventry Bira, who is head of the secret police, to lead the atomic bomb project. Secrecy around the project would be of the utmost importance. Because so many of the Soviet Union's best physicists had been rounded up in the Great Purges covered in episode 25, Bira simply built a prison inside the prisons. In that way, the project's secrecy was kept from the other prisoners. A special ministry was formed to oversee the project called the Ministry of Medium Machine Building, which was overseen by the Ministry of Innocuous Sounding Names. The scientific arm of the project would be headed by Russian physicist Igor Kurchatov. At the same time, Stalin developed a network of spies in the United States to learn all of their secrets regarding nuclear research. The drive to build the bomb became even more urgent after Stalin learned through his spy network that the Americans had successfully detonated an atomic device in July 1945. This was one race the Soviets did not want to lose. Kurchatov was authorized to hire up to 37,000 workers for the project. Work was conducted in the city of Mayak, hidden away in the Ural Mountains to the east of Moscow. With astonishing speed, the Soviets completed construction of a nuclear reactor in Mayak in June 1948. In July 1949, the Soviets detonated their first nuclear device in the deserts of Kazakhstan. In 
Through a combination of scientific research and espionage, the Soviets became the second nation to develop a nuclear bomb. The atomic race was on. In 1949, Kurchatov was granted permission by Stalin to build an experimental nuclear power plant in a nameless city south of Moscow. In June of 1954, a year after Stalin's death due to natural causes and Barrio's death by a bullet to the forehead, the power plant went online. But instead of an enormous celebration, the plant opening was kept a secret, and only a few government employees and party members knew about it. Nonetheless, construction of more nuclear power plants proceeded across the Soviet Union, which, following their victory during World War II, was becoming an industrial and urban giant with an unquenchable thirst for electricity. In the late 1960s, the Soviet Union started a vast expansion of their nuclear energy-producing capacity. Plant construction commenced across the country. In Ukraine, leaders there wanted the plant close to the capital and largest city, Kiev, a site was chosen about 50 kilometers to the north of the city where the Pripyat and Dnieper rivers converge, and the Belarusian border was just a stone's throw away. The plant was officially named V.I. Lenin Nuclear Power Station, but because so many buildings and projects were named after Lenin, it was more popularly referred to as Chernobyl, the nearest major city. The man put in charge of the construction project, Viktor Brukhanov, was given near-dictatorial powers. He arrived at Chernobyl in 1970 with only a briefcase and a rubber stamp for approving orders. Brukhanov had to supervise the construction of both the power station and the new town of Pripyat to house the workers. Before he could start work on that project, he had to construct buildings for the delivery of supplies, build a plant to make the vast amounts of required cement, construct housing, and build a supermarket to feed his workers. The plan for the new power plant was based on tried and tested plans at other locations. Only this time was going to be scaled up to accommodate greater energy production. That did present one minor problem. The necessary parts at the necessary size were impossible to find. Brukhanov had no choice but to manufacture many of these parts on site, and he encouraged a spirit of improvisation among his workers to make certain everything fit and hopefully worked. Other obstacles that Brukhanov faced were his overbearing superiors, the Soviet mentality of never admitting to mistakes and never questioning party leadership. He also found it difficult to attract any qualified workers to this less than inspiring project at an uninspiring location. Workers were young, inexperienced, and mostly unmotivated. The project fell behind schedule, and within a year, Brukhanov tendered his resignation. It was rejected, and he continued on as director. On September 26, 1977, two years behind schedule, the first unit of the Chernobyl nuclear power station was finally commissioned. It produced 1,000 megawatts of electrical power, which was sent mostly to the city of Kiev. It was hailed by the government as a triumph of Soviet science and technology. On December 21, 1978, the second unit went online. Unknown to the operators of the Chernobyl power station, an identical unit in Leningrad had suffered a meltdown of its fuel element. No one knew about it because the entire event was kept under wraps. Mistakes were not discussed, and therefore there was no opportunity to learn from others' mistakes. Before we look at what went wrong at Chernobyl, let's examine how a nuclear power station works. Uranium is the heaviest naturally occurring element and it has several isotopes or variations in structure. The main isotope, uranium-238, is slightly radioactive, but it cannot support a nuclear chain reaction. However, uranium-235 can support a chain reaction. But there's only one atom of uranium-235 for every 140 atoms of 238. When a neutron collides with the nuclei of uranium-235, it splits. When it does, it releases energy and produces elements with smaller nuclei that are often unstable. These are called fission products or radionuclides. In this process, more neutrons are released, which can split another atom, sustaining the atom-splitting cycle in what we call a chain reaction. If there is a critical mass of uranium-235, the chain reaction will occur so fast that there will be an instant explosion. 
That is how nuclear weapons work. Since nuclear operators don't want to take down the whole power plant and much of the surrounding countryside, they have to find a way to slow down this reaction. They do that by using a moderator, which slows down the chain reaction so that energy is gradually released. This is called controlled fission. One pound of uranium-235 can produce as much heat energy as 1,500 tons of coal, so it is more economical than coal or provides a better bang for your buck, if you'll pardon the expression. On the downside, it also releases very large amounts of highly radiotoxic and volatile radionuclides, which we shall see can produce all sorts of health problems for humans. These dangerous substances accumulate in the nuclear fuel rods, meaning it is important to properly contain the rods. In a nuclear power plant, the tremendous heat generated from the control chain reaction is used to heat up water that creates steam. The steam power rotates turbines, which powers a generator that generates electricity that can be transferred to a power grid where it is distributed to various locations. The Chernobyl plant was an RBMK-1000 reactor, a design dating back to the 1950s that did not include a protective containment structure, which means in the event of an accident, the radioactive material could easily leak out. Both the United States and the United Kingdom still had these types of reactors at the time of the disaster, so the Soviet Union was not alone in maintaining these older reactors. The Chernobyl reactor used graphite blocks to contain the uranium fuel rods. Graphite is a naturally occurring mineral known for having atomic properties similar to uranium-235, as well as a high melting point which is necessary when dealing with very high temperatures. The graphite blocks slow down the speed of the fast neutrons that are released during the chain reaction, and slow neutrons are what we want to prevent explosions and sustain chain reactions. Graphite columns separate the fuel channels where the uranium rods are placed. In addition to the fuel channels, there are separate channels that contain control rods made of elements like boron carbide, which absorb the neutrons and prevent the generation of new neutrons, which could start an uncontrolled chain reaction. These boron rods can be moved in and out of their channels, and thus can be used to moderate the intensity of the chain reaction. When they are out, the chain reaction intensifies, and when they are in, the chain reaction slows down. It's just like the accelerator and gas pedals in your car. In the RBMK reactor, it takes 20 seconds to move the rods from completely out to completely in. By modern standards, that is very slow. Reactors that use heavy water as a moderator can complete this process in just one second. Also in the RBMK reactor, the water used to generate steam comes into contact with the radioactive fuel rods, making the water radioactive. More modern reactors heat the water through a separate channel. Water is also used to cool down the hot fuel rods. The Chernobyl reactor was full of pipes with welded joints circulating radioactive water. Another factor to consider is the high operating temperature of an RBMK reactor. The fuel rods operate at a temperature range of 500 to 700 Celsius or 930 to 1300 Fahrenheit. Modern reactors operate at half that temperature. One issue to keep in mind regarding the RBMK type reactor is that it runs much like a jet or airplane engine. While at one end of the spectrum an uncontrolled nuclear chain reaction can lead to an explosion, if the chain reaction isn't minimally sustained, it will stop and the entire plant will power down. Similar to Piper Alpha in the last episode, an emergency shutdown or scram was very costly. It affected the whole electrical grid, meaning possible brownouts or blackouts. Rebooting the system was also extremely expensive. Therefore, many young plant operators would withdraw the boron control rods, putting their foot on the accelerator, even if the process violated established safety regulations, just to keep the plant from powering down. It was one of many instances where the operators did not see eye to eye with the designers. In the 1975 accident at Leningrad mentioned earlier, a reactor unit was being brought back online following maintenance when the operators disconnected one of its turbines due to a fault. Power generation was brought down from 800 megawatts to 500 megawatts just before the graveyard shift took over. 
At 2 a.m., someone took the other turbine down, tripping the emergency shutdown of the reactor. Operators did not want to be responsible for a reactor shutdown, so they chose to increase the power by raising the boron rods. The unintended effect was that capacity skyrocketed to 1,720 megawatts, or twice its rated capacity. That led to a meltdown and release of radioactive particles. A Soviet government commission investigating the accident found serious design flaws and made a number of recommendations to correct those flaws. These findings and recommendations were brought to the attention of the Ministry of Power and Electrification, the government arm responsible for instituting such changes. However, the ministry sat on the report and its contents were kept classified, even from the operators of similar nuclear plants like Chernobyl. In 1979, news of the reactor core meltdown in the United States at Three Mile Island eventually filtered through to nuclear plant operators in the Soviet Union. A meltdown is when the core components of a reactor, fuel, clading, or paneling, and the control rods get so hot that they melt together and become a kind of radioactive magma. Soviet propagandists were quick to pounce on the Three Mile Island event. Surely it was proof that in capitalist systems, the profit motive was so great that safety was a secondary concern. The communist model of never questioning authority and preventing the leakage of any damaging or possibly useful information regarding nuclear plant safety concerns was inherently superior. In 1981, Unit 3 of the Chernobyl nuclear power plant was successfully launched. The launch of Unit 3 allowed for some long-needed maintenance on Unit 1. During restart of that unit in 1982, a water valve was inadvertently closed, which led to the fuel rods overheating and the uranium inside melting down. An explosion in the core caused radioactive materials to escape, mostly within the power plant, but some to the outside air. No one was killed, but cleanup workers were exposed to radiation, and the streets of the small town of Pripyat were watered down as a precaution. Again, containment of news of the meltdown was so thorough that workers at the other power plant units were unaware anything had occurred. In December 1983, Unit 4 of the Chernobyl nuclear power plant was launched, while construction on two more units, 5 and 6, commenced. Those last two units would never be completed. One of the chief concerns of the RBMK reactor is that it requires a constant flow of water into the core. Without that continuous flow, the fuel would overheat and there would be a meltdown or explosion. Even if there is a shutdown, the fuel within the core would still be generating decay heat, which could also damage the core. The pumps that drive this continuous flow of cooling water rely on electricity generated by the plant's own turbines. No sense going outside the power plant when electricity is what you produce. In the event of a shutdown, the power supply can be switched over to the national grid. If that fails, diesel generators will automatically start up to power the water pumps. However, those diesel generators take about 50 seconds to gather enough energy to operate the massive pumps. 50 seconds can seem like an eternity when you're trying to prevent a nuclear meltdown. In case of an emergency, there are six tanks of pressurized water that can be injected into the core once the diesel generators are up and running. Unfortunately, the RBMK needs to continue pumping 37,000 tons of water per hour, or 10 tons per second, to cover the 50-second gap before the diesel generators come on. That, folks, is a problem, because anything short of 50 seconds risks a meltdown. Here's the solution the Soviets came up with. The turbines that turn to create the electricity that goes to the grid are powered by the steam created from the heat of the nuclear fission. In the event of a shutdown, those turbines will still be spinning due to inertia, just like your car keeps moving after you take your foot off the gas. And just like your car, the turbines will slow down until they come to a complete stop. During that time, the turbines are still producing electricity, and maybe just maybe that will be enough electricity to power the cooling pumps until the diesel pumps are up and running. So far, so good. The plan works in theory. Wouldn't it be great to test out this theory in the real world before putting the unit into operation? You bet it would. Did the Soviets do that? 
No, they did not, because the reward for launching the reactor unit on time was very substantial, while the outcome for delaying the launch was most likely getting sacked. Therefore, Bryukhanov and his higher-ups in the ministry signed off on safety tests that were never conducted. The actual safety tests were conducted after the fact on Unit 3 in 1982, 1984, and 1985, and the test failed all three times. The turbines did not supply enough electricity to cover the 50-second gap, and thus the danger of meltdown remained after an emergency shutdown. Now, Unit 4 was already operational, and no one was certain what would happen in a shutdown. So the test was refined and altered, with the engineers hoping that maybe this time that 50-second gap could get covered. It was decided that the next test would take place in Unit 4 at a time when the unit would be taken offline anyway as part of scheduled maintenance. The test experiment was scheduled for the afternoon of April 25, 1986. But the National Grid Controller asked the chief engineer, Nikolai Fulman, to wait until after electricity consumption peaked before taking the unit offline. Fulman agreed to reschedule the test for the evening. The afternoon plant staff had been briefed on the test and knew what they needed to do. The evening crew had a vague idea of what they needed to do. To further complicate matters, most of the fuel rods in Unit 4 were nearing the end of their productivity and needed to be replaced. The older fuel rods were hotter and more radioactive than the new rods, meaning it was even more crucial that there not be a lengthy gap before the water pumps kicked in. Here's how the test was supposed to run. Step 1. The reactor was to be running at a low power level between 700 megawatts and 800 megawatts. Step 2. The steam turbine generator was to be run up to full speed. Step 3. When these conditions were achieved, the steam supply for the turbine generator was to be closed off. Step 4. Turbine generator performance was to be recorded to determine whether it could provide the bridging power for the coolant pumps until the emergency diesel generators were sequenced to start and provide power to the cooling pumps automatically. Step 5. After the emergency generators reach normal operating speed and voltage, the turbine generator would be allowed to continue to freewheel down. This test was just getting underway when the national grid manager called again. Another power station in the area had unexpectedly gone offline. Could the test be delayed until after the other unit came back online? Chief Engineer Foman agreed again. It wasn't until 2304, or 56 minutes before midnight, that the grid manager gave the chief engineer the green light to proceed with the test. By this time, the evening shift were preparing to leave, and the graveyard shift was starting. No one on that shift had been briefed about the test. Not only that, but the notes the evening shift left for the graveyard shift were often indecipherable. In one phone conversation, an operator asked a plant supervisor, What shall I do? In the program, there are instructions of what to do, and then a lot of things are crossed out. The supervisor thought about it and responded, Follow the crossed out instructions. During the shift change, from evening to graveyard shift, the plant power level decreased to 50%. The test proceeded and at five minutes after midnight, the power had been brought down to 700 megawatts. At this point, the reactor suffered what is known as xenon poisoning, which sounds like something you might hear about in an ER room, but it is actually a nuclear plant condition where a byproduct of the fission process blocks the chain reaction, slowing down the process dramatically. This caused a precipitous drop in the power level. When that level had dropped to 500 megawatts, the reactor operator, Leonid Tuptanov, took action. But the consequences were not what he intended. He lowered the control rods, which had the effect of blocking more of the chain reaction. That caused the power plant level to plummet to just 30 megawatts, near shutdown mode, and not enough energy to run the water pumps. The power plant was now at 5% of the minimum safety levels. At this point, Chief Engineer Anatoly Dyatlov had the authority to stop the test and return conditions to a safe level. But that would mean Dyatlov would have to report back to his superiors that the test process failed without even yielding any results. That would look very bad in his superior's eyes, and Dyatlov was famously short-tempered. He insisted that the test continue. Tuptanov and Chief Shift Manager Alexander Akimov 
objected due to the safety concerns, but eventually acquiesced. Under Dyatlov's direction, control room personnel attempted to restore power by disabling the automatic system governing the control rods and manually extracting the majority of these to their upper limits. Several minutes elapsed between their extraction and the point that the power output began to increase and subsequently stabilize at 160 to 200 megawatts, a much smaller value than the planned 700 megawatts. The rapid reduction in the power during the initial shutdown and the subsequent operation at a level of less than 200 megawatts led to increased xenon poisoning of the reactor core. This restricted any further rise of reactor power and made it necessary to extract additional control rods from the reactor core in order to counteract the poisoning. Knowing that 200 megawatts was still far too low to perform the test, the crew overrode additional automatic safety systems and manually raised more of the control rods in order to reach the 700 megawatt threshold. At the same time, they connected all eight water circulating pumps and increased the flow of coolant to the core to 60,000 tons of water per hour as part of the test plan. That was another safety code violation as the safe limit was established at 37,000 tons per hour. In order to increase power output, the operators removed all of the remaining control rods except for eight. That's out of 211 control rods. The absolute minimum according to safety guidelines was 15 and now they were using eight. If the automatic safety systems had been enabled, the system would have shut down by now. Tuptanov's computer readings were demanding that the system be shut down. The control operators were uneasy. During later investigations, it was reported that some nervousness was observed by the deputy chief of turbines, and Dyatlov reportedly told Akamov, do not procrastinate. At 1.23.04 a.m., the experiment began. Four of the main circulating pumps were active. Of the eight total, six are normally active during regular operation. The steam to the turbines was shut off, beginning a rundown of the turbine generator. The diesel generators started and were expected to power all of the water pumps by 123.43. In the interim, the power for the pumps was to be supplied by the turbine generator as it coasted down. As the momentum of the turbine generator decreased, so did the power produced for the pumps. The water flow rate decreased, leading to increased formation of steam voids or bubbles in the core. Because of the positive void coefficient of the RBMK reactor at low reactor power levels, it was now primed to embark on a positive feedback loop, in which the formation of steam voids reduced the ability of the liquid water coolant to absorb neutrons, which in turn increased the reactor power's output. More and more water was converting into steam, and power was increasing exponentially. Tuptanov spotted this, and he shouted to Akamov to shut down the reactor, consequences be damned. At 1.23.40 a.m., Akamov pressed the emergency protective safety button, AZ-5, to initiate a scram or emergency shutdown. That should have brought down all of the boron control rods, stopping the reaction and ending the positive feedback loop but that is not what happened. The control rod insertion mechanism moved the rods at 0.4 meters per second so that the rods took 18 to 20 seconds to travel the full height of the core, which is about 7 meters. A bigger problem was the design of the RBMK control rods, which had graphite neutron moderators attached to boost reactor output when the rod was withdrawn. Those displacers had a one-meter column of water above and below them when the rods were at maximum extraction, and lowering the rods displaced the neutron-absorbing water in the lower portion of the reactor with moderating graphite. Are you following me so far? As a result, the scram increased the reaction rate in the lower part of the core as the graphite displaced the water coolant. The rod stopped lowering and would not budge. A knocking sound could be heard throughout the main reactor hall. Akamov released the clutch on the servo motors, allowing the gravity to drop the rods into place. But nothing happened. I thought my eyes were coming out of my sockets, Dyatlov recalled later. It was clear that this was not a normal accident, but something much more terrible. It was a catastrophe. 
the displacement of the water caused a surge in positive reactivity in the lower core, resulting in a huge increase in heat and steam production. That heat actually melted and distorted the tubes where the control rods were located, and that caused a jam. The control rods were wedged, and there was no hope of retrieval. The reactor core was now stuck in a fission chain reaction that was increasing exponentially. Investigators later calculated that within four seconds of an AZ-5 activation, the power plant was producing at 100 times beyond the approved maximum. The increasing heat and pressure ruptured the water pipes, causing the automatic safety valves to close. The safety valves then ruptured. A plant worker reported seeing the 15-meter-wide disc comprised of 2,000 metal covers that sealed the top of the reactor, bounce up and down as though on a trampoline. The worker took off running after witnessing this event. The fuel rods were now at 3,000 degrees Celsius or 5,400 degrees Fahrenheit. 18 seconds after the scram button had been pushed, there was a massive steam explosion that blew the 450-ton biological shield clear off the reactor and through the roof of the reactor building, exposing the reactor core. The explosion ruptured more fuel cells and severed most of the coolant lines. Immediately, in-rushing air and steam reacted with the fuel's ruined zirconium plating to create a volatile mixture of hydrogen and oxygen, which triggered a second, far more powerful explosion. Fifty tons of vaporized nuclear fuel were thrown up into the atmosphere, and a further 700 tons of radioactive material from the graphite containment vessel were ejected. Those particles would eventually scatter all across Europe and Western Asia. A good portion of Unit 4 was blown away, while Unit 3 was severely damaged. The extreme heat of the reactor fuel combined with inrushing air to ignite the remaining graphite, creating an intensely hot fire that would take weeks to extinguish. When the electrical lines were destroyed, the workers in Unit 4 were thrown into darkness. Twenty years later, Sasha Yuvchenko, an engineer at Chernobyl, described what he witnessed. There was a heavy thud. A couple of seconds later, I felt a wave come through the room. The thick concrete walls were bent like rubber. I thought war had broken out. We started to look for Kademchik, a workmate, but he had been by the water pumps and was vaporized. Steam wrapped around everything. It was dark, and there was a terrible hissing noise. There was no ceiling, only sky. It was a sky full of stars. Half the building disappeared. There was nothing we could do. There was shock and confusion in the control room, as one would expect following two large explosions in a nuclear reactor. The Atloff was convinced the reactor was still intact. If he had just looked out his control room window, he would have seen the obvious. Nonetheless, beyond all reason, he ordered Akamov to send two young trainees to physically lower the control rods with their hands. It was a suicide mission with no chance of success. If gravity and machinery couldn't lower the rods, there was no way possible they could be lowered by hand. The trainees made their way through all of the destruction to the reactor hall. They were there for only a minute when they realized there were no control rods to lower. Everything had been blown up. They returned to the control room tanned a deep brown from the radiation. A few weeks later, both men died. Dyatlov, who may have been delusional following the explosion, refused to believe the core was gone. Valery Perovchenko, the worker who had seen the reactor top bounce up and down before the explosion, now organized a search party in the aftermath. There was debris everywhere. Most of the workers were unaware that the debris contained chunks of uranium fuel and radiated graphite. Perovchenko and others desperately searched for their fellow workers until they reached the point of passing out from the radiation. A part of the roof had collapsed in the turbine hall of Unit 4, setting one of the turbines on fire and breaking an oil pipe. The burst oil pipe was spreading fire everywhere. Other plant operators worked furiously to remove oil tanks within the plant. They were able to get the tanks to a safe location outside. If the tanks had blown, it could have taken down Units 1, 2, and 3, causing meltdowns in those reactors. Shortly after the accident, Firefighters arrived to try to extinguish the fires. First on the scene was a Chernobyl Power Station Firefighter Brigade under the command of Lieutenant Volodymyr Pravik, who died just days later of acute radiation sickness. The firefighters weren't told how dangerously radioactive the smoke and the debris were, and may not even have known that the accident was anything more than a regular electrical fire. 
Grigory Kamel, the driver of one of the fire engines, later described what happened. We arrived there at 10 or 15 minutes to 2 in the morning. We saw graphite scattered about. Misha asked, Is that graphite? I kicked it away, but one of the fighters on the other truck picked it up. It's hot, he said. The pieces of graphite were of different sizes, some big, some small, enough to pick them up. We didn't know much about radiation. Even those who worked there had no idea. There was no water left in the trucks. Misha filled a cistern, and we aimed the water at the top. Then those boys, who died, went up to the roof. Voschik, Kolya, and Volodja Pravik. They went up the ladder, and I never saw them again. The firefighters' immediate priority was to extinguish the fires on the roof of the power plant and the area around Reactor 4 to protect Reactor Number 3 and keep its core cooling systems intact. Those fires were extinguished by 5 a.m., but many firefighters received high doses of radiation during their effort. The fire inside Reactor 4 continued to burn until May 10th. It is possible that well over half of the graphite burned out. The graphite fire was extinguished by a combined effort of helicopters dropping over 5,000 metric tons of sand, lead, clay, and neutron-absorbing boron onto the burning reactor, and injections of liquid nitrogen. Colonel Teletnikov, in charge of the second wave of firefighters, described his experience fighting the fire at Chernobyl like this. I cannot tell you who told me about the radiation. It was a station worker. They all wore white uniforms. As we were putting out the fire, you had the impression you could see the radiation. First, a lot of the substances there were glowing, luminescent, a bit like sparklers. There were flashes of light springing from place to place as if they'd been thrown. And there was a kind of gas on the roof where the people were. It was not like smoke. There was smoke, too. But this was a kind of fog. It gave off a peculiar smell. None of the men Talatnikov sent to the roof survived, and Talatnikov himself died of radiation-induced cancer in 2004. The fire crews were all ignorant of how to fight a nuclear fuel fire. They had never been trained, because none of the top officials ever expected one. This led to a number of unnecessary deaths. The explosion and fire spewed hot particles of nuclear fuel, and also far more dangerous fission products into the air, such as casium-137, iodine-131, and strontonium-90. Residents of the surrounding area observed the radioactive cloud on the night of the explosion. The equipment used to put out the graphite fire included remote-controlled bulldozers and robot carts that could detect radioactivity and carry hot debris. Chief Investigator and Atomic Energy Deputy Director Valerie Legasov said, in 1987, We learned that robots are not the great remedy for everything. Where there was very high radiation, the robot ceased to be a robot. The electronics quit working. Viktor Brukhanov and his superior chief plant engineer Nikolai Fomin were told the radiometers were reading 1,000 runchins, a high level but not a lethal level of radiation. However, that was the top end of the radiometer device. The real level was calculated to be eight times higher or extremely lethal. Brukhanov reported to Moscow that the reactor was intact when it wasn't. He assured them that Unit 4 would be back up and running in no time. Both he and Dyatlov waved off claims from panicked staff members that their readings were also off the scale. Within hours, Dyatlov became so sick from radiation exposure he could no longer work. Eventually, Barukhanov saw with his own eyes that Unit 4 was completely destroyed and radioactive materials were spewing out of the facility. He requested that the adjoining town of Pripyat be evacuated immediately. Moscow denied the request. They did not want to cause a panic. Without an evacuation order, the people of Pripyat began their day just as any other. Children went to school, people went about their business, those scheduled to work at the plant arrived for their shift, and even a wedding was held in the afternoon. One man showed off to the others the excellent tan he had acquired sunning himself on the roof that day. That night, he was vomiting violently. But as the day went on, word got around about an incident at the reactor. There had been an accident and a fire. Children crowded around one of the local bridges to get a better view in what turned out to be one of the most radioactive spots in town. That evening, residents could see a glow coming from the stricken reactor. 
If it had been raining, the radioactive particles would have fallen to the ground and made the situation much worse. Soon, police roadblocks appeared at all of the exits out of town. As residents grew more worried, many escaped by running through the forests. A commission was set up the same day to investigate the accident. It was headed by Valery Legasov and included nuclear specialist Evgeny Velikov, hydrometeorologist Yuri Israel, and radiologist Leonid Ilyin. They flew into Kiev and arrived at the power plant on the evening of the accident. By that time, two people had already died and 52 were hospitalized. The delegation soon had ample evidence that the reactor was destroyed and extremely high levels of radiation had caused a number of cases of radiation exposure. They spent much precious time arguing with government ministers about the severity of the incident. In the early hours of April 27th, 33 hours after the initial blast, they ordered the evacuation of Pripyat. Initially, it was decided to evacuate the population for three days, but later this was made permanent. The order was transmitted by Soviet officials over local radio. We are doing this for your own health and safety, and particularly that of the children, stated the message. Buses will be coming in from Kiev, enough for everyone. This is only a temporary evacuation. Bring enough food and clothing for a few days, and don't forget to bring your ID papers. Stay calm. Remember to turn off your lights and water before you leave. You won't be gone long, and you won't be going far. The nuclear expert, Legasov, knew different when he heard the announcement. There was no going back. Pripyat is uninhabitable. The evacuation was orderly, and aside from a few holdouts, most of the town was evacuated within two hours. Moscow set the original exclusion zone at 10 kilometers radius. Six days later, that was changed to a 30 kilometer radius, and everyone that had been relocated within that new radius had to pick up and move again. There was little to no organization at the destination locations. Residents in those locations found themselves responsible for taking care of the evacuees. There were shortages of food and shortages of water, and many people forgot their papers, which made doing just about anything difficult in the Soviet Union. In May, the evacuation radius for pregnant women and children was set at 60 kilometers, and there were instances where the radius was as much as 400 kilometers from the reactor site due to the rains that contaminated the countryside. In 1986, 116,000 people were evacuated, and in 1987, another 220,000 people were evacuated. The most heavily irradiated people were the firefighters and plant workers. Those displaying symptoms were flown to Moscow Hospital No. 6, which specialized in treating radiation illnesses. Due to the long trip from Pripyat to Moscow, many of them arrived in poor condition. Their family members were not allowed to visit them. The patients that arrived were so full of radiation that many of the nurses, doctors, and orderlies were afraid to approach them, and those caregivers that did often died later from radiation sickness themselves, just from being in contact with the patients who contacted the original radiation more than a thousand miles away. With the number of radiation victims growing, the government was forced to expand out to hospitals 7 and 12 and so many hospital employees refused to treat the victims that army soldiers were brought in to perform the duties of the nurses and orderlies. Ludmila Ignachenko, a wife of one of the firemen who died after being transported to hospital number six, remembered her husband's experience. The doctors kept telling them that they had been poisoned by gas for some reason. No one said anything about radiation. My husband started to change. Every day I met a brand new person. The burn started to come to the surface, in his mouth, on his tongue, his cheeks. At first, there were little lesions, and then they grew. But every day I would hear my husband say, Dead! Dead! Tishura is dead! Titanok is dead! Dead! He was producing stool 25 to 30 times a day, with blood and mucus. He became covered with boils. When he turned his head, there would be clumps of hair left on the pillow. The last two days in the hospital, pieces of his lungs, his liver, were coming out of his mouth. He was choking on his internal organs. At the morgue, they had to cut up the suit he was buried in because his body had swollen so much. Not quite as glamorous as radiation exposure in the movies, no bulging muscles and climbing up walls with spider-like dexterity. This stuff kills, and it's a gruesome death. Two months later, Ludmilla gave birth to their child. 
the baby lived for only four hours. She'd been exposed to a fatal dose of radiation emanating from her father. Approximately 100,000 people were examined in the weeks following the explosion, and 18,000 of those required hospitalization. More than 5,000 doctors, nurses, and other health care providers were needed to take care of them. Radiation at that time and place was measured in Röntgens, named after the German physicist Wilhelm Röntgen, who discovered X-rays. Humans and other living creatures are exposed to radiation on a daily basis, with the most common source being the sun. But aircraft, industry, rocks, and some foods emit radiation in very minute amounts. The typical human receives 23 micro runtions per hour, a totally harmless amount. A chest x-ray will deliver a dose of 0.8 runtions, which is equal to the annual dose limit for a radiation worker set by the U.S. Nuclear Regulatory Commission so try not to go wild on those chest x-rays. The limit for the general public is much lower at 0.1 Röntgens. Following the explosion at Unit 4, the hotspots were measuring at 30,000 Röntgens per hour. Just 500 Röntgens received over 5 hours is considered a fatal dose. The volume and intensity of radioactive particles thrown into the atmosphere on the night of the explosion was equal to anywhere from 10 to 40 Hiroshima bombs. That doesn't include the hundreds of tons of reactor fuel and graphite that landed all over the plant. Ionizing radiation, the kind of radiation we're talking about, displaces neutrons from atoms. Ionizing radiation causes cellular degradation due to damage to DNA and other key molecular structures within the cells and various tissues. This destruction affects the ability of cells to divide normally, which in turn causes the symptoms. The onset and type of symptoms depend on the radiation exposure. Relatively smaller doses result in gastrointestinal effects such as nausea and vomiting, and symptoms related to falling blood counts and predisposition to infection and bleeding. Relatively larger doses can result in neurological effects and rapid death. Treatment of acute radiation syndrome is generally supportive with blood transfusions and antibiotics with some more aggressive treatments such as bone marrow transfusions being required in extreme cases. Cancer is a common long-term effect, but in the worst cases at Chernobyl, bone marrow transfusions would not take because of the cellular damage already endured. Symptoms manifest in many ways. Destruction of white blood cells harms the body's natural immune system. Destruction of red blood cells prevents blood from congealing, a necessity for recovering from injury. Gastrointestinal symptoms include vomiting, loss of appetite, and abdominal pain. Intestinal infection can lead to death. Neurovascular symptoms include dizziness, headaches, and a decreased level of consciousness. The most noticeable symptom is the burning or blackening of the skin, starting from deep within the skin and moving out to the surface. Because ionizing radiation can damage DNA strands, it may also cause mutations which can be passed down to offspring. Following the evacuation of Pripyat, the Soviets could concentrate on extinguishing the graphite fire at Reactor 4. Helicopter pilots were actually withdrawn from their assignments in the Afghanistan war to assist in the effort at Chernobyl, where they dropped sandbags into the molten crater. The first few crews suffered radiation sickness after only a few hours as they hovered 200 meters above the fire in temperatures up to 200 degrees Celsius, dropping the sandbags by hand. They soon switched to dropping the bags from a net suspended from the helicopter. This did help decrease the temperature of the fire, but it kicked up an enormous amount of radioactive particles. Sandbags were dropped for the next four days until Soviet scientists realized the weight of the sand might actually collapse the foundation of the reactor, leading to a far worse scenario that might render Ukraine and Belarus uninhabitable. Legasov and his associates came up with a two-pronged approach to combat the foundation collapse. The first part called for draining the pressure suppression pool below the reactor, which had filled with radioactive water from broken pipes. The second part called for injecting liquid nitrogen into the ground beneath the reactor to harden the ground. That would strengthen the foundation and cool the superheated core. So far, so good. 
three extremely courageous volunteers stepped forward to drain the suppression pool. Courageous because draining the pool required hand-turning two valves in the basement submerged under the highly radioactive water. Engineers Alexei Anandenko, Valery Bezbalov, and Boris Baranov donned wetsuits and dove into the flooded basement together. Stumbling in the darkness after their flashlights gave out, the trio located the valves and drained the suppression pool. Every English-language book and article states that all three divers died shortly after opening the valves. However, British author Andrew Leatherbauer refutes this, providing evidence that one died a natural death in 2005 and the other two are still alive. That same day, oil drilling equipment was brought in to pump liquid nitrogen into the ground, but there was a delay in the arrival of the nitrogen. Deputy Chairman Ivan Siliev phoned Barukhanov and told him, find the nitrogen or you will be shot. Barukhanov found the nitrogen. Using military persuasion to convince tank drivers to enter the contamination zone, Barukhanov had the nitrogen pumping by dawn. However, the problem was more serious than it appeared. Despite the pumping of liquid nitrogen, the core was still in danger of falling through to the Earth's water table below the plant. Miners were brought in to dig an enormous cavern to hold a refrigeration device that would cool down the reactor. Because of the fragility of the foundation, they were forced to dig the hole by hand in stifling conditions without respirators. One month and four days later, the miners completed their task. But by that time, the core was cooling on its own, and instead the cavern was filled with heat-resistant concrete. Unlike the divers, many of the miners died from radiation exposure. The funny thing about airborne radiation is that even if you are a top-down, information-suppressing government like the Soviet Union, that radiation will eventually find its way to other countries with no such concerns. Fifty-three hours after the accident at Unit 4, physicists in Sweden detected a radioactive plume over their country and they published a detailed map of the fallout and gave advice to individual households about contamination risks and necessary protective measures. The Swedes published most of their scientific findings and made the information public almost immediately. Before entering Sweden, that nuclear plume had also visited Poland and Finland. But within days, all of Europe to some extent and parts of Asia were also affected. The factors for greatest contamination were proximity and altitude. Mountainous areas were most likely to receive precipitation, and rain tended to concentrate the radioactive particles. Ukraine, Belarus, and Russia had the highest rates of contamination, but areas like the Alps, the Scottish Highlands, and the Scandies in Sweden also received high amounts of radiation. Rain was purposely seeded over 10,000 square kilometers over the Belarusian Republic by the Soviet Air Force to remove radioactive particles from clouds heading towards highly populated areas. Heavy black-colored rain fell on the city of Gamal. Reports from Soviet and Western scientists indicate that Belarus received about 60% of the contamination that fell on the former Soviet Union. Fatalities in Europe were not as high as might be expected. The British National Radiological Protection Board predicted at that time that over the next 50 years the European community could expect about 30 million people to die of natural, non-nuclear related cancers. But there would only be 1,000 cancer deaths directly attributed to Chernobyl during the same time period. Livestock populations were more heavily affected. In Scandinavia, the reindeer populations depended on lichen for their main source of food, and lichen was prone to heavy contamination. Laplanders depended on reindeer meat as the main part of their diet, and much of the reindeer population had to be destroyed because they were so heavily contaminated. Germany, Poland, and Wales had the same problem with sheep, whose food was also contaminated. In the first three months after the accident, 237 people suffered from acute radiation sickness, and 31 of them died. Most of the victims were fire and rescue workers trying to bring the accident under control. They were not fully aware of how dangerous the exposure to radiation in the smoke could be.
A 2005 International Atomic Energy Agency report states that 28 emergency workers died from acute radiation syndrome and 15 patients died from thyroid cancer in the following years, and it roughly estimated that cancer deaths caused by Chernobyl may reach a total of about 4,000 among the 5 million persons residing in the contaminated areas. There are other estimates that run into the tens of thousands. The report says it is impossible to reliably predict the number of fatal cancers arising from the incident because the various prediction models vary greatly in their methodology. Greenpeace claimed the number of deaths ranged from 10,000 to 200,000, while the New York Academy of Sciences stated in a report the number was 985,000. Unlike the heat waves in Paris and Moscow and the great smog in London, in which deaths were calculated by comparing aberrations in the death rate against the norm, Chernobyl-related deaths occurred and continued to occur over decades, not weeks. Not long after the graphite fire was extinguished, the Soviet Union put together a military and civilian effort to clean up the effects of the disaster. These liquidators, as they would be called for their mission of liquidating the problem, would number some 240,000 people in 1987, and by 1990 some 600,000 people would be certified as liquidators. Dams were built to block radioactive particles from entering the drinking supply. An entire forest, nicknamed the Red Forest because of the color the trees turned after dying, was completely buried. Helicopters sprayed the ground of the contaminated area with a special polymer resin to trap the radioactive dust. The most contaminated villages were bulldozed and buried, while thousands of buildings were sprayed with special chemicals. 300,000 cubic meters of contaminated dirt was dug up and buried in a remote location and then covered with concrete. Grigory Medvedev, a nuclear inspector who worked at Chernobyl, and wrote a prize-winning book on the subject, described what he witnessed during the cleanup. I saw soldiers and officers picking up graphite with their hands. They had buckets and were collecting it by hand. There was graphite lying around everywhere, even behind the fence next to our car. I opened the door and pushed the radioometer almost onto a graphite block. 2,000 runtions an hour. I closed the door. There was a smell of ozone, of burning of dust and of something else. Perhaps this was what burnt human flesh smelled like. Liquidators were told by government officials not to have children for the next five years because of the dangers posed by their exposure to radiation. Most ignored this recommendation. The Unit 4 reactor was far too contaminated to be moved or buried. Instead, it was decided that the entire structure would need to be contained within another larger structure nicknamed the sarcophagus by those who built it. It was one of the most difficult civil engineering tasks in modern history, owing to the scope of the project and the short time in which it was completed. Robots were used to clean up the contamination on Unit 3 until most of the robots broke down from radiation exposure. When that failed, military reservists were sent in to do the work the robots could not complete. They were limited to working on the roof for only 40 seconds at a time, as anything beyond that time would be fatal. They wore lead-plated suits that could only be used once because of the high radiation exposure. The sarcophagus was completed by November of 1986. It contained 400,000 cubic meters of concrete and 7,300 tons of steel reinforcement. It was not a complete seal, as that would have built up dangerous pressure inside. However, many of the leaks were caused just by the sagging weight of the structure. Combined with the accident in Fukushima, Japan, the nuclear industry in Western nations has suffered a reverse. Countries such as Germany, Belgium, and Lithuania have adopted policies of nuclear phase-out, while Asian nations such as China, South Korea, Vietnam, Indonesia, and India are expanding their nuclear power industries. Japan, Great Britain, and the United States have vastly slowed down their nuclear power capacity and in some cases have stopped building nuclear power plants altogether. Once the dangers of nuclear-generated power were brought to light, the public rapidly lost their appetite for electricity generated from nuclear fission. It's quite possible that their Chernobyl crisis contributed to the downfall of the Soviet Union, one of history's largest empires. According to former Soviet leader Mikhail Gorbachev, 
the Chernobyl explosion was a turning point that opened the possibility of much greater freedom of expression to the point that the system as we knew it could no longer continue. Gorbachev introduced his policy of glasnost, or openness, of ideas and expression shortly before the Chernobyl explosion. He considered it a remedy for the widespread censorship and government secrecy inherent in the Soviet system. To Gorbachev, Chernobyl proved the wisdom and necessity of glasnost. The explosion and widespread publicity that ensued, he claims, made absolutely clear how important it was to continue the policy of glasnost. Gorbachev inaugurated Glasnost as a way to counter the system of secrecy advocated by his opponents. But Chernobyl would be the ultimate test of that openness. Remember, most Soviet citizens didn't even know about the explosion and meltdown at Chernobyl until after the Swedes reported it. Once people learned about the scope of the disaster, the dangers of radiation, and the cover-up by their government, many became panicked and suspicious. They had been told all their lives that the Soviet Union was the most powerful nation on earth and that the Soviet system was infallible. Once people realized the dangers they had been exposed to and how little their government did to prevent it, they lost trust in their leadership. Even after Stalin had killed tens of millions of people, they had still maintained their trust, right up until Glasnost and Chernobyl destroyed it. The disaster at Chernobyl was entirely preventable. But so many errors and oversights along the way make it difficult to determine which action contributed to the problem more than the others. The Chernobyl plant was already outdated when it went online, and other reactors in other countries could move the control rods much faster and get the nuclear fuel cooled much quicker. The plans for scaling up from a smaller facility were inadequate. Falling behind the construction schedule led to hasty design flaws and a disregard for vital safety regulations. A desire to please superiors along with an aversion to bringing errors and mistakes out in the open also contributed to this disaster. Designers and operators waited too long to conduct this crucial test. An arrogant chief engineer, under pressure from his Moscow superiors, made one poor decision after another and refused to recognize events that were clearly in front of him. Firefighters and other responders were ill-prepared to fight a radioactive fire at the nuclear power plant. Evacuation orders took too long to implement, and evacuees were harmed by the government's veil of secrecy. Other nations were not notified about the radiation leak and did not find out until Sweden detected it. Emergency personnel were not prepared to handle radioactive patients, and the effort to contain the destroyed reactor was characterized by a blatant disregard for the health and safety of the cleanup workers. Chernobyl may win the Podcast of Doom prize for ignoring every single lesson learned in previous incidents. Congratulations. Thank you for joining me for the Podcast of Doom. Please feel free to comment regarding your thoughts by emailing me at podcastofdoom at aol.com or visit me at www.thepodcastofdoom.com. I've received a lot of great episode suggestions, and I want all the listeners to know that I am making great use of those suggestions. I am sure it is no surprise that Chernobyl was suggested as an episode by several listeners. I'm still collecting your questions for a Q&A segment. I'm sure there must be something on your mind that you've been wondering about. I recently just added a couple of posts on the Facebook page regarding the fire at Grenfell Tower. That is looking to be a major tragedy, and others posted that there are similar towers to Grenfell all around the world. So again, you can email me at podcastofdoom at aol.com or go to the comments section of the website at www thepodcastofdoom.com, or reach me via Facebook by searching for The Podcast of Doom. Next time, we will explore two ship explosions. The first involved two vessels colliding in the harbor of Halifax, Nova Scotia. The second took place in Texas City, Texas, when a fire started in the cargo hold of a ship carrying 2,200 tons of ammonium nitrate. Until then, keep your ears pinned and your tail taut. 